Uh, we're continuing our look verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, it is my job and that of Brother Joshua, who is our associate minister here in the pulpit, as well as you, uh, all the men here and the ladies too, to be a part of, uh -oh, let's see. there we go, to be a part of standing for the truth of the gospel of God's grace. We saw in the first session in the book of Acts that Paul defends the ministry he received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now that Paul is dead and is with the Lord, when I say dead, his physical body is dead, he's alive there, his soul with the Lord, there are those of us who must serve our generation, and it says about David, he served his generation until his death. Well, this is our generation, and we're to stand in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. Later we're going to see, and Terry read it this morning, where Paul says, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you only one Father, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, therefore be ye followers of me. Paul is the only person in scripture other than the Lord Jesus Christ to ever say, follow me. And, then, and, and I bring that up because to follow Paul is to follow the message of Jesus Christ our Lord from heaven's glory for today in the dispensation of God's grace. So it is my job to study out myself and to teach and preach the things that Jesus Christ wants us to know through Paul. That's why we rightly divide the word of truth to understand God's word to us today. Last time, we saw how to be faithful stewards. Brother Don put it, put it on the internet. He can make you a CD or a DVD if you want. So we won't go through that, but that was the beginning of chapter 4. Look what it says in verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, to sum it up, we looked at the word steward through Scripture. The first time steward was used was with Abraham. He had a steward named Eleazar, um, who he thought would be his heir. And God says, no, I'm going to give you an heir, a child. It, it was ended up being Isaac, through you and Sarah. That steward had all of the, the, the household management of Abraham's goods. So a steward, you're a household manager. Um, that's what we're to be as grace believers with the mysteries of God, the mysteries of Christ. Now, we went through that. It's the things that make up the mystery of Christ, the message given to, to the Apostle Paul. In verse 2, we ended last time. It says, moreover, it is, what's that next word? Required. This is a job requirement to be a, a faithful steward. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, over, in, over in, the, in the Gospels, the Lord talks about when he returns and he judges the, 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 the believing remnant of Israel. Those who were faithful over little, he's going to make them ruler over much. If they were faithful in this, he's going to give them ten cities. Israel is going to rule and reign over the Gentile nations. They're going to reign over the earth. And how faithful they are through, let's close the chart, through the, as God, I mean, when I say Israel, I mean, Adam's going to be in the earth. We, so I'm, I'd say the Old Testament saints. We know the nation of Israel, but the prophetic saints, Adam, Abraham, Noah, all these people, they're all going to have rulership in that kingdom. But when Christ was speaking to uh, Israel in his day, he, he tells the believing remnant that they not, that they not only had to endure and, and keep believing on him, but based on their service to him then is how they're going to be rewarded in the kingdom, their reward, okay? They're going to have ten cities and five cities and, and so forth, so on. They had to be faithful servants. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well, similarly, it's different, but it's similar, at the judgment seat of Christ, and the thing you and I are going to be judged on individually is how much of Paul's doctrine we both know and walked in. That's it. The Lord is literally going to open up the word of God, the rightly divided word, particularly Pauline truth for today, and judge your soul on how much sound doctrine from Paul you built up. That's why we exist here and we preach week after week the Pauline grace message. That's what you're going to be judged on as a member of the body of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, only members of the body of Christ save people from, from Paul on to the rapture. Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. To the last person saved and then the rapture, all of us will be before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to be judged on. Christ is going to see how much of Paul's doctrine we have built up in our own soul and walked in. That's why we're teaching you this. It's the rightly divided word, okay? 
Verse 2, it says, moreover, it is required. So it, it is requirement to, to hear that the Lord says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have to be faithful. It is a requirement. Look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, you have to stay in the Pauline grace message to get your full reward to your death or the rapture, whichever comes first. Paul is dealing with the rapture here. He says, found faithful. When the Lord comes, he, he, God says he wants to find us faithful in the grace message. Faithful means you're committed to it. We use it when we talk about husband, wife, or marriage. Nobody wants an unfaithful spouse. Well, I wouldn't say nobody. Some people are crazy. I don't want an unfaithful spouse, and my wife doesn't either. Faithfulness is a commitment that we use it for marriage, your spouse. Well, we use it for service, too, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a grace ministry for each of us to walk in. I said earlier in the Acts study, Paul says, I have finished my course. And the Lord Jesus has given each of us as individuals a course in life. How do you know your course? That's what Paul's epistles is about. It's, it's laboring in the grace message. I can tell you where to start. Twin Cities Grace Fellowship is here to teach you the message. Just start there. Get it in you. It'll work. You'll find your, your place in the ministry and you fulfill it to your death or the rapture. But the first thing is to stay with Paul's doctrine. It is required that you found faithful. Found faithful. I wrote myself a little, as I thought about that word faithful, the simplest way I can describe faithfulness is you're always there. I can't even name the saints because I'll forget somebody, but we have some faithful saints who are always here. They put this ministry, and, and this local ministry, this local body of Christ ministry, local assembly, above everything else in their life. That's faithfulness. And God takes that serious. Always there. That's what faithfulness, whether it's a spouse or whether it's a, min a, a ministry, always there. Verse, four, verse 3. But with me, now this is with Paul, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. Now, today's message is, should we judge others? You know, when you've been in ministry a while, you're just dealing with particularly lost people, it's funny how lost people know a particular verse from the book of Matthew. We're going to look at it. And that verse is, judge not. Well, anybody know the rest of it? Lest you should be dressed right. But, and, and, and now when they bring it up, it's to say, don't judge me. I want to do my own thing. Don't say nothing. I don't want to hear your Christian views. Don't say nothing. Separate your church and state. Don't say nothing. But if they actually went over and looked at the verse, go over to Matthew chapter 7. The Lord Jesus Christ wasn't saying that, and he was talking to Jews of his day, you've got to keep it in context, but he wasn't saying not to judge. Let's actually, you know, somebody could actually go and read the verse like we do. Matthew chapter 7. The question I asked today on the board is, should we judge others? Well, like a lot of things Paul, in the scripture and Paul writes, it's yes and no. And I'll, I'll show you. Yes and no. Okay? It depends on what the judgment is. Matthew chapter 7, the Lord is, is giving his, his Sermon on the Mount as the Messiah to Israel. He's speaking to the, to, the, to the multitudes there. Look at verse number 1, Matthew 7 verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, what's the first word of verse 2? For. That word for in Scripture when you study, it's, it's, a, it's a word of further explanation. He's continuing the thought from verse 1. For, see, people don't go to number verse 2. They just say, judge not that ye be not judged. But wait a minute, verse 2 says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. He's not telling them not to judge. He's warning them. He says, if you decide to judge someone else, beware. Because with the judgment you judge them, God is going to judge you. See, that's what he's saying. Look what he says in verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. See, God dealt with the nation of Israel under a law called Moses, the law of Moses, a performance-based acceptance system. Israel was to treat, to love their neighbor as their self. 
And however they treated their neighbor was how God was going to recompense them. It's important. Listen, he says, judge not lest ye be judged. For, verse 2, with the judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, he's saying how you judge, and, and we're going to see what that word judgment means. I'm going to give you a biblical definition. How you judge someone else, God is going to judge you that way. That's called law, performance-based acceptance. Go down to chapter, go over to cha Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Matthew 6, 14. You don't want God to deal with you based on this type of principle, okay? Watch this, verse, verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There you go, hey. You forgive others, God will forgive you, the Lord tells these Jews. The Jewish people were the children of God in his day. Today it's the body of Christ. He says, if you forgive your brother, God will forgive you. But watch this, verse, don't, don't stop there. Same thought, verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. See, that's the law. If that Jew didn't forgive another brother, God wouldn't forgive him. Now, God does not deal with you and I today based on that principle of if you do, then God will. In Israel, because they were under the law, if then principle. If you do this, if you do right, I'll bless you, God says. If you don't do right, I'll curse you. That was the law. God's grace message through Paul in his 13 epistles, Ephesians 4.32 says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Today, forgi our forgiveness before God is not based on whether we forgive another. It's based on the cross of Calvary. When you and I trust the shed blood of Christ for our sins, we're forgiven all our sins. All of our sins were put on, on the Lord Jesus Christ's soul at Calvary. All our sins were future from Calvary. We, Calvary happened nearly 2,000 years ago. God accounted us righteous there when we trusted. Therefore, all your sins are forgiven whether you forgive someone else. That's not how God dealt with Israel. That's why you have to rightly divide the scriptures and study it dispensationally. The, the, the instructions in Matthew 7 and 6 aren't talking to you and I. That's how God dealt with Israel under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace, Romans 6, 14. And so in order for them to be forgiven, they had to forgive other men their trespasses. Today, because we are forgiven all our trespasses, God then asks us to forgive. See the difference? Law says, you won't get forgiveness unless you forgive others. Grace says, I've forgiven you, now forgive others. See the principle? That's how you rightly divide. So the judging, when, 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 when people shout out, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, the principle there in Matthew is, he's not saying don't judge. He's just saying to those people in that day, with what measure you judge, it'll be measured unto you. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We are to judge. We are to judge, but we are not to judge. What do I mean? Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse, 4, verse 3. Right after talking about being a faithful steward of the mysteries of God, the, 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 the mysteries that make up the mystery of Christ, the doctrine, sound Pauline doctrine, his, his, his ministry. Paul then comes to something kind of strange. He's talking about being a faithful steward in chapters 2, 3, and 4. And then he says, verse 3, but, contrary, with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. By the way, that's a great principle to live, particularly if you're in the ministry. I was, I was saying that Paul was preaching God's word in the book of Acts. People were trying to kill him. They were putting him on trial. They didn't want to hear the truth through him, so they shoot the messenger. In ministry... Like I just I said it before, you're going to offend. If you speak for a living, you're going to misspeak. If you speak for a living, you're going to offend, even if it's God's word. Away with him, they said, Christ, away with Paul. And when you preach God's word for a living, then you really got, it's offensive. The cross is offensive. Paul's ministry was actually offending the, the Corinthians, and here's why. They were so carnal. Watch what happened. Verse 3. But with me, with Paul. It is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. You know, when the apostle Paul, he was so Christ intoxicated, he only cared about the Lord. 
that when, when, when people were railing against him and rebuking him for whatever reason they thought or offended him, whatever, he didn't care. And, and, and I can tell you, the, more, the longer I'm in ministry, that's my, I can see why he feels that way. If, if, they, if they didn't like what the Lord said and people found fault with him and he was perfect, how much more us, we do make mistakes. He didn't. And they, didn't, they found fault. So Paul was like, you know what? As long as my heart before the Lord is in the, in the ministry, in the truth, let the chips fall where they may. Paul didn't care what people thought. That, that's, that's, that, that's what he's saying. Look at verse 3. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. That issue of man's judgment. Paul says when it comes to human discernment about me, and that's what it's about, we'll see. He didn't care about all that. He didn't care whether men said, oh, brother Paul, we, we love you. Or he didn't care whether they said, we didn't like you. I mean, he wasn't looking for acc human accolades. That's the point. He only had one thing on his mind, and is the Lord pleased with my ministry? Watch this. Yea, I judge not my own self. I thought about that. I said, what does he mean by that? Well, over the years, I thought about it. Paul was so humble. And he, he said, I am less than the least of all saints. He says, if you really look at my life as Saul, to be used of God in this capacity of ministry, that's a miracle. Paul didn't feel like he was worthy enough to even be used of the Lord, even saved, let alone used in ministry. Paul says, if you look at my life, how I was destroying the, the church of God, that Messianic Jewish kingdom church, for, for Christ to save me, that was gracious enough. Then he put me in ministry. So Paul always looked at himself. So, so I'm sure as time went on and he looked at the graciousness of Christ, he says, Lord, I'm not worthy of this. And you know what? Sometimes we can condemn our own selves, couldn't we? We know of, uh, that we're accepted in the beloved, the Lord Jesus. And yet sometimes when we sin against God or when we, when we don't live up to being who we are in Christ, our conduct is not as it becomes saints. We can sometimes get down on ourselves. And Paul says, don't do that. He, when he did that, when he thought bad about himself, he says, wait a minute. You know what? It's not about me, my good or my bad. It's about who I am in Christ. That's what he's saying. End of verse 3. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Verse 4. For I know what? Nothing by myself. That's the principle of human thinking. What we know is nothing compared to what the Word of God you need to line up your thinking process with the written word of God, particularly through Paul, and then rightly divide it. Um, Paul says, yea, let God be true, and every man a what? Liar. And that includes yourself. So whatever thoughts you have, just filter them through the rightly divided word and make sure God is always right, we're always wrong, unless we're, we, we're, we're, we're always wrong unless we line up with the written word of God. There it is. And that was Paul. He says in verse 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Now, Paul is about to deal with his ministry. The Corinthian saints do what carnal saints do today. They judged Paul's ministry and the effectiveness of Paul's ministry by how popular it was. They looked at numbers. Now watch this. This is important because we live in the days. They, they want to see how popular Paul was. Paul was not very popular in his day. He's not today. They looked around in a little assembly like this with a few little people, a little flock, and says, hmm, if that really was the truth, how you all see it, how come that guy's not preaching? He got 10,000 people at his church. How come that woman over there is not preaching and she got 100,000 dollars a year salary and 10,000 in her church. They look at numbers and the Corinthians did it too. Carnality looks at numbers. How many people were saved on the ark? Eight. Just a little bit over 100 people were following the Lord in, in the, in the, in the, around Jerusalem right around here in Acts 2. He was perfect. Why didn't he have a big following? Well he did but as the ministry went on, they didn't endure, and they kept leaving them. John 6, 66, they kept leaving them. So in the Bible, there's always a small remnant of people who actually believe God, a small remnant. In fact, the believers in Israel were called the believing remnant, the little flock. The Lord Jesus Christ says, fear not, little flock. He was a shepherd over a little flock. So when you see this little assembly and stuff, but God does great work, go back to, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me show you something. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 1, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 1 and look at verse number 26. Facts start at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren. Now watch what Paul says about, about, about grace believers. How that, those next two words, not many, not many wise men according, after the flesh. These are real intellectuals. You find, in my dealings with atheists and agnostics, a lot of them are natural born intellectuals. And professing themselves to be wise, Romans 1, they become fools. That's what he said. They're too smart for their own good. They have to rationalize. No, no, just believe God's word. Watch this. Not many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty. That's, that's the, the, the ability to, to, to have power in the world system. Not many noble. Uh, you don't get a lot of great politician people with great names are called. You know what it is that makes up God's believers? Just little people like you and I. Little people. Nothing as far as the world looks at. The religious system look at somebody like me preaching, and because I didn't go to cemetery, I mean seminary, excuse me, I said the word. They just, teach you, they just teach you not to believe God's word in a seminary, okay? Because I don't have all these degrees out here, neither did the Lord, neither did Peter and them. Listen here. I get my nose in this book and labor in that book. But because I don't have all these degrees and seminary and all that, the school and all that stuff, oh, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, I'm in the body of Christ. I'm a minister because I study God's word rightly divided and teach it. And that's my part in the body. Well, look here. Not many wise men, verse 26. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. Verse 27. But who? God. See, Paul understood a principle about who God is, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things, bases, a base, a basement, it's the lowly things at the bottom. God has chosen those lowly things at the bottom, watch this, to, uh, excuse me, base things of the world, verse 28, and things which are what? Despised. The world looks at this little slip and says, what is this? What is this? Religious carnalism, look at the law, look at the little assembly. Not knowing that God wants it that way. So he, well, he's, look what he says. And base things, verse 28, and things that are spy, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Do you know God can take, he, he chooses the little so he can get the glory? I remember back there with, uh, in the book of Judges, a man named Gideon, the lowliest of the low in Israel, Hiding from those Gentiles, he, the barley bread man, he's making barley, he's down there, he's hiding away. And God says, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon says, who are you talking to? <laughs> me? No, not, not me. I'm the lowliest of the low. He says, that's the guy I want. So Gideon takes all these men to battle the, the, the Gentile enemies. And God says, you know what? You got too many, Gideon. And he gave him a series of tests for these men. And he dwindled them down to 300 so that they could fight all those thousands of the enemy with 300 so they can know God gave them the victory and not themselves. That's what God wants. Look what he says. Verse 29, here's, here's the point. That no flesh should what? Glory in his presence. Look here, if, if the job gets done, we can't say what we did. Because we're nothing, we're a little thing. But when it gets done, we can say, to God be the glory. Great things he has done. Just like the song, he gets it done. Look at um, chapter 2. That issue of judging, go down to verse number 14. You know, when it comes to judgment, it, it means, basically the word judgment means to discern, okay? When, when you go, I, I like justice programs. I don't like much TV. I watch a little of the news till it upsets me. It's all bad. I like justice like Judge Judy and these cop shows that they, they solve crime. I like justice. A judge basically just discerns facts. A judge sits, hears the facts, the evidence, and then makes a discernment, a, a judgment, a judgment call, as it were. They discern it. In, in, in the Bible, judging means to discern, particularly spiritually. But it doesn't always have to be spiritually, but most of the time it is, okay? To discern something. To have some wisdom about some things based on fact. That's, that's what all judging is. Now watch what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 
and verse number 14. But the natural man, that's the unregenerate, that's the lost man. You're just born naturally into this world. That's someone who hasn't trusted the shed blood of Christ for their sins and become a member of the body. It's just a lost person. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are, what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are, what? Spiritually discerned. There's my word, discerned. A lost man can't just open the Bible and start reading and get great understanding. I mean, he can see some facts. Okay, Christ. Uh, um, that lost guy, Christopher Hitchens, who now has throat cancer, interesting. It's interesting. He uses his mouth to blaspheme God and, and Christ and Christians. And pretty soon, if that cancer keeps going in his throat, he won't be able to talk. That's just interesting to me. I am just, I'm just saying. But he's, a, he's an atheist, and he said he had an interview with some female pastor lady, something or another, who, who was just as liberal as anybody else. And he told her, he says, look here, you're not a Christian if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. He told her that because she didn't know what the gospel was. He says, no, no, no. Jesus a Christian is someone who believes that Jesus Christ died on a cross for their sins was, it was buried and rose again the third day. He don't believe it, but he know the fact. He also went so far as to tell her, now, watch this. He knows some things that most Christians don't know. He said, Jesus spoke to the Jewish people. Christianity as we know it began with Paul. He said that in an interview. Just look it up on the, on the, on the internet. Christopher Hitchens. Why? Because when he reads the Bible, he doesn't do what Christians do, mix law and grace, and he just let it say what it said. And he, he said in that interview, that woman didn't even know, he says, Christianity as we know it start with Paul. Jesus spoke to the Jews under the law. Paul sp speaks to the Gentiles. He said that. That's what we preach. Now, we believe it. He doesn't. It's foolishness to him, though. He thinks the Bible's just man-made. Verse 14, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But look at verse 15. But he that is what? Spiritual judges, ETH on the back of a word in your King James Bible is a continual thing. He that is spiritual judges and continues to judge how many things? All things. Should we judge others and everything? Yes. All things. He says all things. But, now watch this, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of how many men? No man. When you understand, by the way, the definition of spiritual, if you think you're spiritual, here, here's the definition. Here's how when I deal with people to know whether I can deal with them on a spiritual level. Hold your hand there and go to 1 Corinthians 14. Write this verse down. Spiritual doesn't mean you speak in tongues. Spiritual doesn't mean... You can, whatever people say, you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and all this nonsense that people don't rightly about. There is a verse in your Bible that tells you whether you're spiritual. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse 37. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 40, uh, 14, verse 37. Paul sums it up, the ministry here uh, with, the, with the sign gifts. We'll get to it one day if the Lord tarries. Paul says in verse 37, if any man... That's anybody. Think himself to be a prophet. That means you speak for God or what? Spiritual. So let's say you say, you know, I'm pretty spiritual. You ever had a lost person tell you that? I don't go to church, but I'm spiritual. I have my own spirituality. <laughs> you ever people say that? Okay, you, this is what you tell them. Here you go. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, watch this. Let him, what's that next word? Acknowledge. That's more than just having a knowledge of it. It's to act upon the knowledge. That's what the word means, to act upon it. Put it in practice. Here's what you got to put in practice. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you. Who, who is writing this? Paul. That's Paul. Are the commandments of the Lord. Paul tells us that if someone thinks they're spiritual and you can judge and discern whether they're really spiritual, is their answer to who the apostle Paul is. Are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ today coming through anyone but Paul? That's the answer. Based on their answer of, of Paul's apostleship ministry and message, you can, you can judge their spirituality. 
You're not spiritual, according to the word of God, unless you act upon the knowledge that the things that Paul writes are the commandments of the Lord. There are grace commands. I ask people two questions. I say, I find out if they're saved. I said, does anyone ever love you enough to ask you, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Will your soul go to hell or will your soul go to heaven? That's a question out of love. I want them to know for sure. I don't want them to be thinking, wondering, not sure. You can know for sure. So then we give them the cross. I give them the cross. I show them they're a sinner from the law. They broke the law. They've told lies. All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8. If you've ever told a lie, a fib, a white lie, a, a little exaggeration, God says you deserve hell because he's holy. He never lies, exaggerates, uh, fibs, and any of that. And you got to be perfect like God to get to heaven. Well, nobody's perfect, Brother Ron. Yes, there was one, the Lord Jesus. And he died. The perfect one died on the cross and took your place and my place, took our sin upon him, judged in him by God, and then rose from the dead. And now he can offer his righteousness to you and I when we trust him. So that's the first thing I ask. The second question, once we deal with salvation, don't go about Paul or the Bible and all that. Deal with the cross first. So now they're saved. My second question to someone is, who is your apostle? If they say Apostle Wilson, like they took like a church I was at the other day, no. <laughs> if they say Jesus, if they say Peter, like the Roman Catholics, whoever, you, you know right off the bat they're not spiritual. One name need to come out of that mouth. Paul's our apostle for today. Acts 9, 15, Jesus Christ our Lord says, he is my chosen vessel. The Spirit of God testifies through Paul in Romans eleven thirteen. 13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment. To acknowledge is to walk in the knowledge, act upon it. Based on your life as a Christian, you ought to be following Paul as he follows the Lord. That's a spiritual person. Now, if you are spiritual, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things. You can now sit. Do you understand we're going to be judges throughout all eternity? I'm going to show you that both this week and next. You can do now what you're going to do for Christ in all eternity. Watch this. Because you understand some Pauline sound doctrine, you can make spiritual discernment about life. You can walk in wisdom. You can deal with stuff. Watch this. They, he judges all things, but he, he himself is judge of no man. Think about that. What does he mean? Look at verse 16. This is going to blow you away. At least it did for me. Four, further explanation. Who have known the mind of the who? Lord, that he may instruct him. Hey, watch what Paul does. Don't miss this. To be spiritually minded is to have the mind of the Lord. And for someone who is not spiritual to sit in judgment on you and I who are spiritual, it's as if some man is sitting in judgment of the Lord. Watch that. Watch that, what he's saying. Four, who have, so Paul is now dealing with, he himself is judged of no man, for who have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. Who can come to the Lord Jesus and say, here's what I need you to do, Jesus. Do this, do that. The Lord will zap them right there and just make them dust. Nobody's going to tell the Lord anything. He's God. He's the most wise God, the all-powerful wise God. No man instructs the Lord. Paul is comparing, but look at the rest of the verse. But we have the mind of who? Christ. Do you get that? Because we listen to Paul and we have spiritual discernment, the mind of Christ today in the dispensation of grace is found in Paul's 13 books. So the more of that understanding of the grace message found in Romans through Philemon you have in your soul and your mind, you can operate and judge the way the Lord Jesus would. And when somebody who don't know that information comes and judge you, you just laugh at them. Ha! Huh? That's what Paul is doing with the Corinthians. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, I mean, I'm going to be frank with you. Paul looked at these carnal Corinthians who he got... It was his gospel that saved him. He was like their father. It'll be like my daughter, Jada Lynn, at one years old, telling me what to do. You know what that'll result in? A spanking. She don't know nothing. She don't know, how, she don't know a fraction of the stuff that I know. 
It's insanity. Well, that's what Paul is saying. That's what the Corinthians were doing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 again and verse number 3. But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man judgment. Yea, I judge not myself. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. Paul says, that's not the issue. But he that judges me is who? The Lord. The only person who could stand in judgment over Paul the apostle was the Lord Jesus. Think about that. That's how spiritual he was. There was not a man on planet earth who understood more of God's word. Now get this. There's, there wasn't a human being on, on, on earth who understood both parts of God's word. He was a Pharisee. A law, he, was a law, a law, he was a teacher of the law. So he knew all the Old Testament and the prophets. He was steeped in that Judaism. He understood it. And then he had all knowledge. When we get to 1 Corinthians, if, if you want to know about spiritual gifts and operation, y'all need to be with us when we get to 12, 13, 14. Don't miss it. Paul says, although I have all knowledge, Paul knew everything that a man could know each, uh, uh, progressively. In other words, at any moment of time, there was not a more knowledgeable man about what God was doing than Paul throughout his life, throughout his life, throughout his life. He grew in it, but there was, you couldn't, you would, you say, who knows more about anything what God is doing? Paul does. That's what he's saying. He knew everything, all knowledge. Look what he says here. Got five minutes. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Verse four. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. Verse five. Therefore judge, what? Nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. I got to deal with verse 5 next week. Be with us. But as we come down to the end, I want to show you something about judging. Should we judge others? Well, the answer is yes and no. In this way, you can't judge someone's heart. Only God can. That's the issue here. The, the Corinthians were looking at Paul's ministry by the numbers of followers he had. If you look at a grace ministry by numbers, you are already out of the box. There will never be a lot of numbers in truth. They were judging how popular the Apostle Paul is. He's not popular in Christianity both now or then. Paul says in 2 Timothy at the end of his ministry, all they that be in Asia have turned away from me. People don't like the Apostle Paul. So don't go by the popularity. That's, see, when you look at numbers and how popular a ministry, that's a carnal mind. That's the point. Don't look at those things. Look at the doctrine that's preached. I've had people tell me they go to a certain church because they like the music. I'll pull the little hair I got out right here. <laughs> or they like the people. Or their family's there. I understand all that. But that's not what you're going to be judged on because they're music. Don't look at the ministry by numbers, popular, the music, the people, they nice. What are they teaching you? What are they building in your inner man? It's the sound doctrine of the Apostle Paul that's the issue. Everything else, you're just going to burn up at the judgment seat. We just went over that. Oh, we got to end because I got to go. Here, a couple of verses before we do. When it comes to judging, we, we are to judge certain things. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 12. We're just going to go a couple of verses, then we'll end. I'll pick up chapter 4, verse 5 next week. Chapter 5, verse 12. Look at what it says. It was an issue of fornication in the assembly. We'll get to it, verse 12. But what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Yeah. Paul says God judges the lost, but we as members of the body of Christ, we need to judge each other. In other words, discern things amongst one another. I'll, I'll deal with it in particular, but we do judge. How about chapter 6? Look at chapter 6, verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge who? The world? Well, you say, wait a minute. I thought Israel was going to judge the world. Well, they are. Here, I, I, I'll show you when we get there. I'll do the, the, the details. It's going to be here, the judgments at the great white throne. Because we're in the body of Christ and Christ is the judge. Now, this is a mystery only given to Paul. We, we're judged the world and there's some angelic judging. This is before we throw them in the lake of fire. Look at what it says here. Do you not know, and I'll, I'll deal the details when we get here, verse 2. The saints shall judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you. So he's talking to the body of Christ. Are you not worthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge what? Angels, how much more things that pertain unto this life. 
And, and, and how do we know it's just not sitting in rulership? He starts it off, these people were going to court one against another um, uh, and had an unbelieving judge, a lost judge, decide some things, and they should have done it amongst each other. So that's the point. It has to do with some evil and good. So, oh, we got, we got to end. Um, chapter 10. Go over to chapter 10, verse 15. I got th two minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm having a break on y'all. We're only having a 45-minute study today. It's going to be at 55 minutes next week, so we're going to get a lot. So be ready. No, 1 Corinthians 10, 15. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. See, Paul wants you to judge things. He wants you to discern some things. Don't, don't let people say, judge not lest ye be judged, and go to Matthew 7. We're to judge some things. A couple of more, and then we'll end. 1 Corinthians 11, look at verse 31. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Again, I have to deal with the context when we get there. It's the Lord's Supper, but there's some judgment. Last one, 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 29. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other do what? Judge. Now, that has to do with the spiritual gifts of prophecy. I told you, if you want to understand spiritual gifts... When we, we're going to look at these verses in detail so you can understand it to the point where you can explain it to others. Right now, we have to end, because I have a, a previous engagement. We'll pick up 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5 next week. But right now, if you're listening by way of Internet or even here, if you've never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Will it be in a lake of fire for eternity, or will it be in heaven with the Lord? You choose right now. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. By simple faith and trust in that and that alone, exclusively relying upon the shed blood of Christ, today the grace message says, not of works, he'll save you by the shed blood of Christ. If you're saved today, why are you wasting your life on things other than the Pauline grace message? First of all, your life is going to be a mess and shambles because you're not operating in Pauline wisdom, godly wisdom. But second of all, you're going to do all that other stuff and get to the judgment seat and your eternal uh, abode, and it's all going to be for naught. That's why Twin Cities Grace Fellowship exists, to help you walk pleasing to the Lord in your ministry, your course. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. Father, we thank you that we can get in your word and study it rightly divided, understanding the Bible. Most people don't understand the Bible. You've given the key, which is to rightly divide the things in your scriptures, to understand the ministry and message of the Apostle Paul, and to follow him as he follows the Lord. Though we do have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet we have not many fathers. It was Paul and his gospel alone and his doctrine alone that saves us, Father, and keeps us uh, from being confused and pleasing to you. We thank you for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. We thank you for this fellowship. As we take this offering, because we're going to take an offering, you got to give back if you get something out of the message. For the, for the ongoing of your ministry, we take this offering. We ask that it's used for your glory and the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in your spirit. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. <laughs>